Some companies really come from this. We have no tracking at all. We don't even yeah. know how to map our business model. It's sad, but it is the case in some organizations. I just like literally 20 minutes ago had a conversation about this. <laughs> Let, like, I think this is a really important <laughs> distinction to make. Why do we have outcomes? I think there's two reasons. The primary one is it gives us focus. What should we work on? What should we not work on? And I'm going to say that's 90% of the value of an outcome is it tells you what to say yes to and what to say no to. The last 10% is we're going to measure the impact of what we build. And the reason why I think that's only 10% is because the only way to truly measure the impact of what we build is with the A-B test. And the vast majority of companies don't have enough traffic to A-B test well. So in a lot of ways, we are flying blind. We're making bets. We're betting this thing will have the impact. At the end, we may not even be able to measure the bet very well because we don't have analytics. Even if we did have analytics, we don't have enough traffic to really evaluate. Did it have the impact we wanted? That's okay. Like, even if you never measure impact, even if you never grow the maturity of your internal analytics, you're getting 90% of the value of an outcome by it helping you tell you what to say yes to and what to say no to. Hmm. Hey there, welcome back. I am Afonso and before we dive in, let me just say this. You are in for a treat today, my friend. Two hours with the one and only Petra Villa and Teresa Torres. It doesn't get more special than this. There is so much in this conversation and look, I am obviously completely biased, but everyone who's involved in building products should absolutely listen to this. And I have a little request for you. If you enjoy this episode, please share it with your network. Subscribe if you haven't done so and leave a good review. These things, these tiny little things really, really help uh, the podcast and the larger the reach, the more high quality guests I will be able to bring. So it really, really helps. All right, so Teresa Torres is today one of the biggest names in product and design. She is one of my biggest references. Uh, she's the author of the amazing book, Continuous Discovery Habits, which you need to read if you haven't yet. And she is a product discovery coach at Product Talk. And Petra is probably one of the most successful and talented product leadership coaches out there. Uh, it's her second appearance in the podcast, by the way, so make sure you check that episode, uh, episode out as well. Uh, she's the author of the book, Strong product people which is a must uh, read for product leaders and now more recently the book strong product communities and she's also the founder of uh, one of the best product conferences in the world product at heart so needless to say two absolute legends and what i love about this conversation is how we blended all our different views and, and we're able to address specific topics from different angles. And of course, we covered a lot. So this is, uh, this is an amazing um, conversation and an absolute masterclass on product discovery and transforming your organization. Before we dive in, just a quick reminder that I still have a few spots left in my masterclass on discovering value, which is an advanced program designed specifically for you, product teams and product leaders um, uh, on discovering value. So reach out if you want to learn more. All right, that's it. Everyone, please enjoy Teresa Torres and Petra Villa. Let's get started. We are live. It's so good to see you. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for Thanks. having us. I'm excited to do this. Oh my God, I am so, I'm so excited to do this. I have, my head was spinning the whole weekend. I, I have so many questions and I think this is going to be such a great dynamic. I'm really excited. <laughs> so, um, for the listeners, this is very special. And what's going to happen in the next two hours is that we're going to cover three parts. So the first part of the conversation is um, all about discovering the destination, discovering where to go. Um, and we're going to touch a lot on coaching and how, how to coach teams uh, and product people to be outcome uh, oriented and all that stuff. And then we're going to move into discovering solutions and business models and how to test assumptions and all that stuff. And then finally, creating an environment to foster a culture of discovery. So more on the product leadership, more on the environment, the context, the system in a way. Sounds good, Teresa and Petra? Sounds amazing. Amazing. <laughs> amazing. So... Um, both of you, I don't need to introduce both of you, uh, and there is always, a, you know, as you know, an introduction in the beginning. So I, I just want to dig in. Let's start with um, before discovery. You know, a lot of people want to do discovery. A lot of people have read your book, Teresa, you know, Continuous Discovery Habits. Uh, but before 
actually jumping and doing discovery, what needs to be in place? What, what is actually missing um, in most teams that is blocking them to actually do great discovery? Teresa, yeah, you I, can start on this one. I think a few things. I think um, the biggest thing that's missing most often is a really clearly defined strategic context from leadership. So I think what where teams go astray is they think like, oh, I'm an empowered product team. That means I get to do whatever I want and I get to make all the decisions. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then we get chaos, right? That's not the, the goal. So the first thing that needs to be in place is a really clear defined strategic context. Mm. That's things like um, definitely outcomes are part of that, but also guardrails. So what are we going to do? What are we not going to do? How do we do things here? So this can include things like strategy and vision. I feel like most people don't really know what those words mean. I think it's more about like, we will do things like this. We won't do things like that. Yeah. So, what are you saying no to? Yeah. Thinking about it as guardrails from which within the teams can make dis decisions. So how do we empower teams to make the right types of decisions? That's the goal of our strategic context. I think the second thing that has to be in place is ideally a cross-functional team. So I often refer to the product trio. If I were to do it all over again, it could be, uh, maybe we need a name that doesn't imply a number because it can be four or five people if needed. Um, and then I think beyond that, it's really, um, the third thing I would say is access to customers. Mm -hmm. So they need to mm -hmm. be able to engage with customers on a regular basis and not be going through a gatekeeper. And that not being just lip service. Because yeah, exactly. in the moment they start talking to customers, all sorts of questions are coming up. And that's the important thing that still people protect the teams from having this contact with customers. Mm. I think what's interesting too is those three things sound pretty simple. I mean, strategic context doesn't sound very simple, but we think every leader I've ever talked to thinks they're doing a good job of clearly defining strategic context. But at the same time, they don't think that their CEO is doing a good job of setting a strategic context. It's like it flows, like nobody's doing a good job. Everybody needs more than they're getting. Um, and then I think on the product trio side, it's not enough to just change your team structure. We have to also learn how to collaborate and how to work well cross-functionally. And then on the access to customer side, um, this access to customers is a significant barrier for most teams. So we have to overcome those barriers. We have to, I really believe the right way to get access to customers is to automate that process so that nobody is hustling every week to find people to talk to. But not automating the interviewing process. That's not what Teresa is talking about. Automate the recruiting of mm. the Thank interviewees. You. Petra, yes, <laughs> automating the recruiting. Just to be precise here. Not the interviewing. <laughs> We have spoken so many times on this podcast about how talking frequently with users is so important for product teams. It lets you understand user needs, test their designs, and make sure you're building the right products. But many teams tell me that they can't find time for it in their busy workday because recruiting the right users is too hard. So I want to quickly mention a company I'm advising that can help you with this. UX Signals lets you target users inside your website or app and automatically book interviews into your calendar. So you can put the recruiting on autopilot and just show up for the conversations. Instead of waiting weeks, you can get interviews within a few hours and talk to people while they will still have the user experience fresh in their minds. It's used by big companies and public organizations like DNB Bank, Vips Mobile Pay, Nav, and many, many more who are building digital products and services with millions of users. I really recommend checking it out on uxsignals.com or by clicking the link in the show notes. Tell them Afonso sent you and you'll get a 50% off your trial. That's a good clarification. Okay, so we have strategic context needs to be in place and you, you emphasized what to do and what not to do, as in like yeah. what, what are the things that we're not going to do. Uh, and that you know, speaks into strategy, which I want to just um, dive into a little bit with Petra later on. But just to finish these three things. So strategic context, uh, cross-functional teams, so a product trio, but as you emphasize, it doesn't need to be three people, sometimes it's more. Um, and that's just for clarification for those who are listening might not know, uh, product manager, uh, design lead, tech lead and then uh, access to customers. Yep. So, follow-up question for Petra. Uh, a lot of leaders 
as you also said, Teresa, uh, fail to understand what great looks like. You know, they think that their strategy is actually a strategy in the first place. So um, walk us a little bit through what does great look like when it comes to strategy? Like you go into a company, there's an amazing product leader who's doing a great job in your opinion. What does the, the stra her strategy looks like in a way? Give us a little bit of yeah, a few points. So a really hands-on test is I asked the team to show me their backlog and then I asked them why the things on this backlog are in on this backlog, right? So why are the things there? And in a great environment, people say like, yeah, because we're currently trying to pursue these goals or drive these outcomes. That's what that's our focus for this quarter. So 80% of the stuff in our backlog is there for that particular reason. And oh, by the way, these goals, they contribute to the bigger strategy. So these goals help us measure if we execute that strategy, right? So there is this, you can tie the goals back to the strategy and you can tie a lot of the things on the backlogs, not all of them. That's a bit of an 80-20 thing um, back to the goals that you currently try to drive. And the teams know that there is a connection between the stuff in their backlogs, the outcomes, the KPIs, whatever this company calls it. Um, some love to work with OKRs, some have um, um, KPI trees in place, whatever it is, but they know how they would measure success of the stuff that they currently have on their backlogs. And when, that's another cool thing, when they need to look back. So they launch stuff and then they know, okay, maybe four weeks later we can see a bit of an um, effect on our KPIs. Or three months later we need to come back and check if that had an impact, right? So they have this conversation within the teams and if they know what, what KPI they're currently driving or how they measure success and if they know how this basically belongs to the greater company product strategy or strategy, both is fine, um, mm -hmm. then you're already um, way better off. But that's most often not the case. So they sometimes know a KPI that they're currently driving and optimizing for, but they have no clue how this contributes to the corporate or uh, company or product strategy. So that link is missing and that's mm. clearly a leadership task. Then the storytelling is off at some point or um, this connection has never been made or the teams never ha got the time to wrap their head around what this strategy actually means translated into goals, translated into the epics, backlog items, all these kind of things, work items, work that they actually do. Um, mm. So yeah, that's how I usually go about it. And as I said, there's always stuff in the backlog that, that that's a bug here and that sales needed that uh, checkbox because of, I don't know, sales reporting. Um, so these things always exist. I call them a bit of the sand but there need to be pebble and rocks that we work on. And those things, the big building blocks need to be, um, need to be in line with the strategy and there needs to be an aligned working together towards this focal point. That's another thing. Talk to several teams and see if kind of everybody is working at least along similar ways. Or um, Teresa was saying like um, in these guardrails, I think this mm. is kind of something that you want to see as well. If there are multiple teams. Yeah. Can I build on this? Please. Please. I, I think that there's, I look at this as three key components. There's probably more to strategic context, but I think the three big rocks, vision, strategy, objectives, or outcomes. Objectives or outcomes, use whatever language you like. Mm. Um, I think people mix these things up. So I would look at vision as, what's my inspiring view of the future? Not what are we building? What change are we creating in the world? So I think one of the most famous examples of this is that three minute Dropbox video, access your files from anywhere. Nothing about features, nothing about the product they're building, access your files from anywhere. That's our vision of the future, right? I think that's really important because that reminds everybody why we're doing this. I think strategy, how are we going to win? Not what are we building, how are we going to win? And there's a lot of models for strategy, right? Like there's Richard Rummelt's good strategy, bad strategy of like diagnose the market, come up with an action plan. There's the seven powers where you can look at we're going to win based on this power versus that power. There's Porter's five forces, right? There's lots of ways to define a strategy, but the key is given our vision, how are we going to win? And I think strategy is where we start to say, we're gonna win by doing these things and not by doing these things. And so like a really famous example of this is Apple is gonna win through closed systems. They're gonna own the whole product top to bottom, hardware, software, everything in between. Google strategy, very different. 
We're going to mm. win by getting lots of eyeballs. We'll be on everybody's hardware because we're an advertising business. Mm. Um, and actually, business like the business model ends up being a part of how you're going to win, right? That's a big part of your strategy. And then I think objectives or outcomes is really just, okay, now we're getting into the quarter over quarter. What do we need to execute on that strategy? Mm -hmm. um, and I think all three of those need to be clearly defined. And, they, and I think that strategy piece is often missing. So I think, I think people are getting better at vision. People are getting better at outcomes. But it's that setting the guardrails that is often missing. Mm. Yeah, plus, and maybe I just highlighting two things here is, Sometimes the strategy is not missing. In my leadership coaching, I so often see amazing slide decks, but they're just not shared. Storytelling yeah. is off. Or mm -hmm. they, they said like, yeah, but, but I shared it one in our annual meeting. And I'm like, yeah, okay, but one, <laughs> once is not kind of, it, it, half of yeah. the attendees haven't been there, half of the employees haven't been there, right? So there is research says like 21 times people need to hear things until they can repeat it in their own words. So 21 times, have you shared your strategy 21 times in various formats with your audience? I don't know. So, but that's, uh, that's definitely something that needs to happen to share it more often, make sure that the story around it is compelling. Um, and then the other thing that I was about to say and I entirely forgot, ah, yeah, a, a nice model that I like for the um, vision part and the strategy part is the glue and the kick. So um, I think it's from Gino's Wickman Traction book but and they say like the strategy is more the clue so that glues everything to, together and that we know what we are currently doing and the kick is more this hey why am i coming to work every day this is actually the big problem that we're going to solve mm. and that's broad that's vague that's inspiring that's motivating and the strategy is already a bit because of it helps you to say no sometimes rather concrete to some extent mm -hmm. i think petra you've probably seen this too what's worse is the strategy is explicitly defined but as the organization makes day-to-day -day decisions, there's a different implicit strategy, right? And so yeah. now the teams are like, you're telling me this, but you're really telling me this other thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's, actions there's, there's... speak louder than strategies like yeah. this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, definitely. Culture is what you do. Exactly. But um, if you, you, you mentioned something really important. Um, the gap between company strategy and product strategy, which is something I think is missing uh, sometimes because, you know, product leaders are tasked in a way to, to craft a product strategy, but then they sometimes, not in all companies, but sometimes they don't have the, the overall umbrella of where the company wants to go. And um, the other challenge I sometimes see is that product leaders, um, you know, they read Empowered and, and other great books, um, and they sense, okay, this, I, I got to do this, you know, this is my job as a product leader. But then the teams kind of um, are really hands off. Look, that strategy, that's, that's the product leadership. But I, I sense that there is, of course, um, a loop here that needs to be um, in place, a feedback loop um, that needs to be closed. Yeah, as you, as you said. So the loop from leadership, uh, crafts and communicates or over communicates as you stressed out Petra uh, the strategic context but also learns the insights the continuous insights that are coming from continuous discovery ideally uh, you know it, it feeds back to the strategic context so there's a feedback loop there um, how do you how do you see that and and if you if you agree with that how how have you seen that work in in, in a great in a great company for example how do they close the loop between product leadership and product teams? It's easy for the leaders who have a strong product background because they just take whatever they've done product discovery wise and just um, kind of level, uh, putting it on the strategy level. So they go about creating a strategy as they would go about working on a product. So they do the market research, they look at competition, they look at macro trends, they, they get a lot of data points in, they talk to a lot of users, they look at all the app store reviews, whatever product you have, right? So mm. and, uh, data entry points vary. And then they do the synthesizing. And, and that often is to some extent done in solitude if you're in a leadership role, but hopefully not only. So you want to bring in the other stakeholders, you want to bring in the teams. It's a back and forth as it would be if you would be doing product discovery. So for the product, uh, for the people that have a product background and have worked um, in product teams, it's not 
such such a big change in mind in mindset mm. i'd say um it just the altitude is different and sometimes in coaching they need a bit of help to stay on that higher level altitude um for people without former um product um management background that's the harder bit because then they have then to learn the ropes of product discovery to some extent while they learn how to create a mm. um, great strategy that's the tougher and steeper learning curve i'd say Teresa, add to it yeah i think the part that gets lost is closing the loop. And I think we see this in both product management and in product leadership, right? It's easy to ship features. It's hard to remember to come back and measure impact, right? Mm -hmm. It's easy to communicate a product strategy. It's hard to remember to evolve it. And I think if we think about strategy as this is how we're going to win, and we think about objectives or outcomes as these are our milestones along the way, then every quarter when we miss on an outcome or an objective, which we're all doing all the time, we need to, we need to stop <laughs> and ask, what does this mean for our strategy? Yeah. Do we still think this is the way for us to win? Or do we need mm-hmm. to evolve that strategy? And so I would build in, if you're doing outcomes on a quarterly basis, then on a quarterly basis, there needs to be a reflection and a review of your strategy. And your strategy needs to always be evolving. Absolutely. I really like the uh, Clayton Christensen deliberate versus emergent strategy and the, the, you know, the importance of, okay, you have a deliberate strategy, but you have to be very ready to adapt and to change according to new information coming to light. And you you have to have those feedback loops to ensure that that information gets surfaced and that you adapt. And I think, you know, sometimes people forget about the emergent bit, as you you mentioned. They just think that the product strategy is this grand master plan that's going to last for for three years and, and set things in stone. But um, okay, but let's assume then that we have a, a strategy and then back to your three areas, uh, Teresa, that you alluded to before. So vision, strategy, and then the objectives or the outcomes. Um, let's assume you have the vision, the strategy, and now you have to craft outcomes. Uh, why does discovery start with outcomes? And, and what, what, are, what, what outcomes are you talking about? Let's just unpack that a little bit. Yeah, I like, to, I like to define, so first of all, I distinguish between business outcomes and product outcomes. So business outcomes, I like to derive from a, a revenue model, right? So if we work at a for-profit company, our company cares about growing profit, the inputs into that are increasing revenue or decreasing costs. Something like 80% of product teams work on the increased revenue side. So I need to understand how does my company make, how does my product generate revenue? This is going to be based on your revenue model. So if you're a subscription business, it's going to be number of customers times uh, how much they spend each month times how long they stick around, right? Every revenue model has sort of a corresponding formula. That's helping me identify my business outcomes. Now to get to product outcomes, I think about product outcomes as behaviors in the product. So customer behaviors in the product or customer sentiment about the product. So things like CSAT scores or NPS. Now there should be a connection between those two. The connection is the behavior in the product should drive a business outcome. So if I I need to understand how does my product deliver value to the customer? What behaviors represent value to the customer? If I get my customers to do that behavior over and over again, it should drive retention. It should drive average monthly spend. It should, right, it should be contributing. I should be able to do, as Petra mentioned, KPI trees. I should be able to create a visual that connects all these things. Now, sounds easy is not. (laughs) Exactly. And especially when I make the jump from business outcomes to product outcomes, I have a theory about my product's value proposition. I have a theory about the behaviors that drive that value proposition. Mm And until I start to try to move those numbers and see if those numbers move in relation to my business outcome numbers, it's all a theory. And that's where there's a lot of this iteration and trial and error. And if we're getting it wrong, it either means we have the wrong theory of value for our customer. Maybe we have the wrong strategy. Maybe, we have, maybe we're just not moving any of the numbers and we need to get better at discovery, right? But there's a lot of pieces here. And that, by the way, is in... Just for the listeners, a reality check here. 
that's where we're a lot of, I call them managers and executives now, not leaders, um, already losing their patience, right? Because if you need to figure out what are the numbers that we would like to track, then you need to implement the tracking, then you need to get a baseline, then you need to figure out if the experiments that you could run have an impact on your baseline and then you would kind of optimize the hell out of the things once you figured out okay we have a lever we can influence these kpi that already might take you some months right and and that's why it's so tricky in the beginning um to adopt this discovery habits i think because it some companies really come from this we have no tracking at all we don't even yeah. know how to map our business model it's sad but it is the case in some organizations. I just like literally 20 minutes ago had a conversation about this. Let, like, I think this is a really important distinction to make. Why do we have outcomes? I think there's two reasons. The primary one is it gives us focus. What should we work on? What should we not work on? And I'm going to say that's 90% of the value of an outcome is it tells you what to say yes to and what to say no to. The last 10% is we're going to measure the impact of what we build. And the reason why I think that's only 10% is because the only way to truly measure the impact of what we build is with the A-B test. And the vast majority of companies don't have enough traffic to A-B test well. So in a lot of ways, we are flying blind. We're making bets. We're betting this thing will have the impact. At the end, we may not even be able to measure the bet very well because we don't have analytics. Even if we did have analytics, we don't have enough traffic to really evaluate, did it have the impact we wanted? That's okay. Like, even if you never measure impact, even if you never grow the maturity of your internal analytics, you're getting 90% of the value of an outcome by it helping you tell you what to say yes to and what to say no to. Hmm. That's, a, <clears throat> that's a very uh, important, important uh, thing to mention. And so I just wanted to recap. So the two types of outcomes, business uh, outcomes, product outcomes. The business outcomes are derived from a revenue model or from a growth model. Uh, I, would, I, would, I would like to add on that, that sometimes, or in some businesses, you definitely have to collaborate with other areas of the business to define what that growth model is, like sales, marketing, and so on. Uh, also growth teams, we, we're going to get into it. I, I want to dive into that. <laughs> but let's, let's save that for... For, uh, for later, but um, so we have th those business outcomes and then the product outcomes are the changes in human, human behavior that will drive that business outcome. So what are the things that we can independently as a team own and um, uh, make changes so that those behaviors actually change? Uh, because the business outcomes will be, uh, you know, uh, not independent to, you yep. know, you'll require other teams to, to move the needle. Um, so, what are some of the challenges with not knowing um, those product outcomes? So is, is it a discovery to, to do on the outcomes itself? Like, do we need to do discovery on what the outcomes should actually be if we don't know? I'm talking about the product outcomes now. Yeah, I think to get your first guess at product outcomes, you need to know two things. Who's your target customer? What do you believe is the value proposition you're going to offer them? So I can give you a couple examples to illustrate this. I use streaming entertainment in my book. It's a real common example because everybody in the world is familiar with streaming entertainment. It's a subscription business. I probably want to drive retention. I want to drive average monthly spend. I want to acquire more customers. What are the product outcomes that are going to influence that? I need to entertain you, right? The value proposition of streaming entertainment is entertainment. It's right there in the name. So how do I measure did I entertain you? I think there's two primary ways. Do you watch? How much do you watch? Mm. And did you like what you watched? And I could imagine if you worked at a streaming entertainment company, you're looking at the balance between those two things because you might have cust some customers that watch once a month, but if they loved what they watched, they're gonna retain. Whereas you mm. have other customers mm. that probably watch every day and it's less important that they love everything that they watch because they're watching more often. So it's not as straightforward as like, oh, I have one outcome that I'm just going to optimize the crap out of, right? There's, there's often a really complex relationship between our outcomes. And on day one, you may not know what that complex relationship is, and that's okay. You just know that conceptually, if Petra signs up for my service, my job is to entertain I Petra. I would. Teresa, I, need her. I would. I know you would. <laughs> um, I, I need her to watch things, and I need her to like the things that she watches. And I think that's 
Um, we all do this. We all focus on engagement and we all focus on satisfaction because that's generally what's required to drive product success. Now that's a consumer example. If I were to look at like a, let's look at DocuSign. With DocuSign, it's not about engagement in the traditional sense. Like my engagement number is different. I'm probably looking at how many documents do you get signed or how many documents do you sign and how easy was the process. Right? But Time can, to document signed. Yeah. I can look at this for any product. What's the value it delivers? Netflix entertains me. DocuSign helps me get contracts signed. And are the actions that derive that value happening? And are people generally satisfied with those actions? It's not that complicated. Now, where we get it wrong is we look at a really specific single number, like time to contract signed which is a great number. Like if I'm trying to close business, I want the time to contract size to get smaller and smaller, but it's not the only thing. If I optimize the crap out of that number, and as a result, my document doesn't get signed mm. because I piss off my client, I have a problem. So there's a, there's, we have to keep all those relationships in mind. And that's where I think KPI trees are so powerful. It allows us to visualize it. It allows us to question what's the relationship between these things. It reminds us to set counterweights we're only going to increase time um, to sign, reduce time to sign up until the point that it doesn't negatively harm satisfaction, right? Mm, absolutely. And I know you've written about this better, uh, KPI trees. Do you want to, you want to give the listeners a little hint of what it is, like briefly, just to make sure they understand? Yeah. So, in the end, so how do you get to a KPI tree? It sounds like just another framework. It's not really. It just brings things in a hierarchy. Um, how I would go about it if I would need to create one is grab one or two colleagues that have a brain. So that's basically the <laughs> precondition. And then <laughs> you need a whiteboard and two or three pens. You can do it on a digital whiteboard as well. I like a physical whiteboard for that. It's a bit easier. And then a drawing does it. So if you're in container shipping, then you draw little vessels and you draw the ocean and then you think about, okay, when is value created? How would people experience value? So you draw your little business and then you really think, okay, what are the things that we can track? Okay, we can track how many containers are on that ship, where the container uh, if the containers go from here to there, um, how often um, they need to reroute it, for example, need to be rerouted while they are on sea, then you, so all these kind of things. So you map your business, create more a drawing than a fancy framework kind of thing, and then think about, okay, what of the things are easy measurable, what is just stuff that we can observe and maybe anecdotally just like track or whatever it actually is, but that's the conversations to have. Mm -hmm. It's really like, it's a bit like go back to this, how would you explain the business of the company to your parents, to friends or something like that over beers. So where's money coming from? Why are people paying? Why are they staying? Why are they loyal? Why are they recommending your service to other mm. people? So all these kind of things. Um, and then at some point, you want to bring it in some sort of an occasion where you know like, okay, this times that equals in this amount of revenue or something like that and then you build this hierarchy of okay if we have revenue on top and you can have other things on top by the way it's not that we only measure success in revenues these days we can have other things customer happiness is an amazing driver for example that eventually hopefully results in revenues if you are for revenue for profit organization um, but you build a bit of a hierarchy as you learn you find more and more KPIs and and they're not equally important to track and they don't have the same amount of impact on on your higher level goals so to say so that's why you create this tree like structure of mm. okay I know this times this equals in that and over here and then you understand how things are tied together what Teresa was saying and you know what things are maybe um, we always tend to optimize for things and we always need to moni monitor other things to not go sideways so some call that health mm -hmm. metrics for example this is something that you can add um, to the tree as well and then you, could, you can do tons of color coding for example a color code the ones that you're currently focusing on this quarter or this all the health metrics are blue and all the stuff that you're currently mm -hmm. working on is green or all sorts of color coding and i like um for example, dotted line connections where we don't have 
certainty that these KPIs are related, but just this hypothesis of maybe if we optimize for that, that has an influence on this as well. Um, and a solid line if we know like, yeah, if we have more visitors on the page down the funnel, this means that we have more mm -hmm. signups or something like that. Because there are right. proven connections between KPIs and then there are these hy more hypothetical ones, then you can use dotted lines and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you can play with how you kind of build the tree. But the basic idea is draw your business and then just like um, map out the KPIs that one would think um, you could optimize for. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thanks. That was great. Um, I think what, one, one particular thing that I really like about KPI trees is the, the, str the caus causal strength uh, between the, you know, the different leading indicators. Um, and that, as you said very well, Petra, if you visualize it, uh, you can actually have that arrow a little bit thicker, so you can you can see that it that one is uh, strongly proven to be leading to the to the upper one, and blah blah blah. So I, I totally agree, very powerful. And I and I think people listening will will of course agree that you know being outcome driven and outcome oriented and all the all that jazz with outcomes over outputs. I I think they would agree. But in some organizations, you just happen to to sometimes have. I don't know, some leaders who are very, pro very output oriented, very project oriented, a whole system, a whole environment, which we will talk about in the end. But um, how do you, you know, very simply, what, what are the first steps into helping an organization that is incredibly project oriented? How do you help them giving their first steps into becoming more outcome oriented and do all these things that we've talked about before? Teresa. Where do we start? <laughs> yeah, I have so many questions. It depends. Like, <laughs> are, are you asking like the question how is, to, are they motivated to do how so? How do Teresa and Petra help companies become outcome focused? Is it I'm an individual contributor at the company? How do I help my company yeah. become more outcome focused? Mm. Or I'm a product leader at the company. How do I help my company become more outcome focused? R let's start. Let's start with uh, your your. Your product team member, so you're in, in you're an IC, you're an individual contributor, okay. and you want to drive change, and you want to help your product leader drive change. The organization happened to be really trapped in very old school kind of projects, but you still want to help. You still want to move the needle in in this direction. Um, what are the few things that you can do um, that will help you and the team yeah. and the leader? I'm gonna have a really counterintuitive answer to this. Okay, so I think overwhelmingly majority of people listening to this because the overwhelming majority of people that work in our industry individual contributors working at an organization that still feature factory like maybe starting to talk about outcomes maybe starting to use okrs probably a good percentage of those outcomes or okrs <clears throat> are outputs and not truly outcomes right like exactly. the majority exactly. of us are still in this very solution focused build this thing if that's you I would, and you're an individual contributor, I would not worry about changing your organization. And I, I, this surprises people when I say this, but you're gonna waste so much of your life pushing a giant boulder up a hill that is gonna roll back <laughs> and crush you, right? Like it's not, you're not the person to drive this change. Here's what you can do. You can focus on, I work in this organization if they're a for-profit company, I know they're gonna care about growing profit. I know that the inputs to growing profit are increasing revenue and reducing costs. I can look at the product that I work on and work to understand its business model and model out what are the business outcomes that in theory my leaders care about but aren't communicating. I can look at what's the value that my product delivers and I can come up with my own product outcomes. I can take that to my leader and get feedback and be like, hey, here's how I'm thinking about my work. What do you think? Now, I'm not doing that because I'm gonna expect my leader to change. My leader has no reason to change. The rest of the organization isn't asking them to change. I'm doing it to get feedback on my thinking, to manage up, to get better alignment, to develop my own individual habits and my own individual skills. And when I do that, it gives me a better context. I'm creating the strategic context I need to make better daily decisions about what uh, that I control. Whatever decisions are in my sphere of influence, which everybody has decisions mm -hmm. in their sphere of influence, I will make better decisions by developing my own outcome mindset. But I don't think it's realistic for an individual contributor to think they're gonna change their organization's mindset on outcomes. 
Petra, rip it apart. No, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm building on it. <laughs> um, I wrote about transformation and why sometimes transformations are not so easy for organizations. And one thing, I, I talk about the three ingredients in that blog post that I think need to be there for organizations to transform. And this is pain, urgency, and an awareness that there is help available. So if they feel the pain and how organizations feel pain is usually by things like revenue model no longer working. So money is currently not flowing as it was in the past or it's super hard to find new employees because maybe culture is not where it should be or something like that. So there needs to be pain in this organization experienced by more than one person, the individual contributor, that, that's not helpful. So there needs to be pain in the system, friction in the system, and everybody needs to have this awareness of, okay, things are off, we might want to do something about it. And then there is this sense of urgency, okay, we need to do it now, because if we not start now, maybe our competitor will outperform us or something like that. So you need this urgency, and then, and that's the easiest part, and that's maybe where an individual contributor could come into play and help is, raise the awareness that there is help available. I so often have client conversations where they at some point stumble across Teresa's book and then they're like, it's all there. It's all in this book. It's amazing. Teresa wrote this book just for us. Whatever book it is, right? But, but they have never ex been exposed to a lot of the thought leaders, product thinking, the books out there, the conferences that are happening, the blog posts that you can read for free or the newsletters you can subscribe to or the podcasts that you could listen. And I think this is something where if you see there is a lot of pain in the organization and the desire to change and ur urgency is already something, but people don't know where to start. And I think this is where an individual contributor can say like, hey, I already read three of these amazing books and I have an idea how my team can be a pilot in some of these things. Mm -hmm. So let me help. I think this is something that you could do, but don't waste your energy. If the other two things are not given, then it's just, I agree with Teresa. Ooh, tough. I, we have a platitude of show, don't tell. And I think it's really appropriate in this context. So a lot of individual contributors try to tell their leaders they're doing things wrong. How do we react when we're told we're doing things wrong? We have research that tells us we dig our heels in, we get more stubborn. We don't say, oh, you're right. <laughs> everything I've been doing in my career up until this point has been wrong. Let me radically change everything, right? Mm. But if you have an individual product team who is suddenly outperforming the rest of your product teams, what happens? Oh, how do I get how do I get more? What is this team doing that's unique? How do I get more of my teams to be like that team? And so then, this, yeah, yeah and then just ahead. quoting Rich Murnoff, uh, he said in Hamburg a few weeks ago, and then don't be the Sheldon Cooper in the room. If you then, if people start to get curious, then speak their language and yeah. don't be such a product geek. Don't be the Sheldon Cooper. That is amazing. <laughs> Hello, Rich. Uh, I'm not Shout surprised. Out. Rich is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. For everybody listening, if you don't read Rich Miranoff's Product Bites, go read it. It's really good. I love it. And, and this is such an important point, the, the storytelling bit. I think that product people sometimes are in their own, their little bubble and they fail to, to get out and to expand and to speak the language that some of the, for example, executives would want to hear that would resonate, that would actually change um, a little bit of their minds, um, basically meeting people where they are, essentially. And, and yeah. they, they come to meetings full of jargon and yeah, but the outcomes and the product outcomes and this. And, and they're like, what, 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 what the hell are you saying? You know, just, yeah. just, um, just, just tell me how, how to grow my business, basically. And so I think this is a skill to, that more product people should invest in. It's like, how do I translate uh, my, my skills in product and the craft to speak in a language and tell a story that CEOs want to hear. Um, I, can I just add, I, I think for most people, starting with outcomes isn't the answer. Too many people look at like an opportunity solution tree and they go, okay, well, Teresa says I should have an opportunity solution tree. That means I need to start with an outcome. I need to have some opportunities and then I need to have some solutions. Okay, And no. the specific colors that Teresa is using. Do you, I think you should use my colors personally. Um, that's really the most important thing is use my colors. Okay. Um, don't, don't do that. Don't like 
I literally named my book, I put habits in the title because it's not a recipe to start top down and do everything exactly right and follow it exactly. It is a collection of habits. And in most organizations, outcomes is not gonna be the easiest habit to start with. And I'm gonna tell you, if you don't have an outcome, you don't need an opportunity solution tree because the purpose of an opportunity solution tree is to help you reach your outcome. So those are probably not the first two habits you're gonna focus on. And if you have no outcome and you have no opportunity solution tree, that's okay. You can still do continuous discovery. You can still interview customers. You can still test your assumptions. You can still create experience maps. You can still do lots of the other habits. And at um, the inaugural Product at Heart, uh, Petra's amazing conference that everybody should go to, uh, I opened the first event. I was super honored to be able to do that. And my talk was all about you have to start with the, yeah, my tagline that I said 17 times in the talk was meet people where they are. You have to start with the habit that is mm -hmm. easiest for your team to adopt. And for the mm -hmm. vast majority of teams, that is not outcomes. Mm. But I, I, I love that. And I, I, I absolutely love two things that you both said that I think um, connect really well. Because, you know, um, Teresa, you said uh, that it's about showing, not telling, obviously. And it's about just in the beginning, almost, hey, here's the work I've done. Here's, here's my rationale. Here's my, the, my mental model of the world. Can you give me some feedback on this? And then by doing that, then linking to what Petra uh, said, why not nudging them to, hey, we are, um, uh, we are succeeding a lot with this way of thinking and, and this approach. Can we have a pilot team with some more freedom to do, to explore some of these things, to start with strategic context, to start with outcomes rather than the outputs? Can we try that as an experiment and measure that experiment and sort of... Uh, you know, for, for more traditional organizations, um, that approach is, is of course, um, maybe more appealing. And that, that will work for some teams. In fact, we shared a story about a product team at Hemnet that did exactly this. They yeah. asked, can we pilot this? It actually was super successful. They had a really supportive leader. Their whole organization is moving towards this. But I still think if you work in a feature factory and your product leader has never heard of any of this, that's not going to work. But it doesn't mean you can't start doing this. Let me, can I tell a personal story about how some of this stuff came about? I told a little bit of this story at a Mind the Product. I forget which one. It might have been I don't, San Francisco. It doesn't matter. 2019. Well, I guess. <laughs> I, yeah, I was at London and San Francisco. It doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> I told a story about I was working at a startup. We ran um, communities for university alumni. So our clients were universities and we operated a community for their alumni to stay connected and engage with the community. Universities care about that because they're trying to drive donations, right? So their business outcome is increase donations from alums. Our primary product outcome, I had none of this language at the time. Our primary product outcome was increase alumni engagement. One of the things I had interviewed a bunch of alums and one of the things I heard over and over again was I get way too much spam from this community. And it's because we were emailing. There was this challenge of like, what did alumni say they wanted from the community? They wanted to hire people. They wanted to like, it was all things where they wanted to like throw their message in front of alums and see like, come to my event, apply for my job. And it was just spam, right? And then the other thing we heard was, I never go to this community because every time I log in, I have 500 messages that are irrelevant to me. So I started working with our engineers and I was like, we got to solve this problem. And I was starting to explore solutions like target messages better. And then one engineer said, we should just integrate a Google map of where everybody lives. Now let me give context for this. Google Maps just released an API where anybody could embed a Google map and programmatically add things to it. And he thought this was the coolest technology ever. And he thought if we add a Google map, people will want to see where alumni live, they'll be more engaged. Okay, what's, now that I have this language of business outcome, product outcome, opportunity, here's what's happening here. He's thinking about the product outcome, we want to drive engagement. He's not thinking about the target opportunity, I get too many irrelevant opportunities, right? And so we're not aligned. We're not talking about the same thing. 
we're throwing spaghetti at the wall hoping something works. Now, I wish then I had this language. I did not. It's actually what motivated me to develop this language, asking, like, what went wrong here? Okay, mm. if you work at a feature factory and you're trying to look at how do I change my organization, if you start at the outcome level, you're speaking a different language. You're not talking at the level everybody's at. Just like my engineer was talking at a totally different level. He's talking at the outcome level. I'm talking at the opportunity level. We're talking past each other. We're never getting to agreement. If you work at a feature factory, your entire organization is talking at the solution level. If you introduce opportunities, they're going to think you're speaking a foreign language. If you introduce outcomes, they're going to think you're speaking a foreign language. You have to start with solution discovery. That's what people care about. The good news is, as you start to explore solutions and you find problems with your solutions, it's a natural time to raise the question, what problem are we trying to solve? Is there a better solution to that problem? Yeah. And now you've just started to talk about opportunities. And then when you learn mm -hmm. you can't even address that opportunity, it's a great time to bring up, hey, what outcome are we trying to drive? Right? So we have to start, this is why I said over and over again in that talk, talk meet people where they are. If your organization is talking about solutions, do not start with outcomes. Yeah, that, that is, um, so the, what you said when it comes to problem and solution, that problem and solution space is intertwined. I think that's how you phrased it before in, in, in your writing, Teresa. That's a really important concept. I feel that, I don't know how, why, maybe, maybe from design thinking um, that you know, it's very typical to see the problem space and then the solution space, mm -hmm. you know, double diamond. Double diamond, yeah. Yeah, yeah classic. Uh, I mean, to me, um, that illustration alone is, is pretty dangerous to yeah, me. Yeah, I agree. B b b because it needs to be more intertwined. And I know I'm being a bit nerd here with the illustration, but, but these things actually matter because people see these things and they, 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 you know, sort of, they get a mental model of the world. Um, I, from these illustrations and, and, I, and I think there's something really important to understand about the context in which these models emerged so I will share I'm a fan of the Stanford D school I did my undergraduate at Stanford I learned design from Stanford before the D school like the precursor to the D school I don't want to criticize their work because it really was formative in who I am of course however when we adopt design methods that come from design agencies all of them IDEO frog adaptive path when any pick any design agency those agencies did amazing work and they definitely helped further the practice of ux but when we adopt a framework that emerges from a design agency where their business model is i need to sell you a big project it's not going to be applicable to a product team that is doing continuous discovery the product team is doing small iterative, fast learning. As an outside consultant, if you sold that, you would sell a day's work, a week's work, and you would go out of business, right? <laughs> yeah. So agencies, exactly. by definition of being external parties, have to sell big projects. Those methods don't have to be what we adopt as internal product teams. Mm. But some are still amazing mental models in coaching situations, for example, if people never of heard of all these things or yeah. stuff like that. And with product leads, I, um, especially the ones with no formal product knowledge, um, for them, it's sometimes a revelation to understand that, ooh, there's a difference between problem space and solution space. Interesting. Yeah, and so yeah that's so interesting. This is, I love... What Petra always does is I always say something really extreme and then she pulls me back to like, what? <laughs> okay. But so sometimes I'm, helpful. I'm not, I'm not saying there's nothing of value from those design agencies. Yeah, okay. I know. In fact, that was the, clear. Ma the majority yeah, that was very clear of people person. work in a project world. And a lot of those tools are going to be a great bridge to introduce mm -hmm. design-minded concepts, right? And start there. But if you're trying to get to continuous discovery, you're going to outgrow those models. Yeah, yeah. And that's how it should be. You know, models should be... We had a, a guest, uh, Carlo Mafus, and he... Yeah! I know Petra fan, really liked it. Fan. <laughs> <laughs> and he And he, he talked a lot about this, this idea of models are meant to be broken. That's how, that's yeah. how you know you're growing. If, if you grow out of the model, if you one day wake up in the morning and feel 
this framework doesn't suit us anymore. Like we, we have a deep, that's a good thing. That's a good sign. Um, so I, I love this, this learning journey into, you know, what you mentioned, Patrick, for some teams, just knowing the existence of problem space versus solution space is great. It's a great starting point. But for other teams, they might mature, yeah, they might mature into the idea of, hey, these things might be more intertwined than we thought before um, because of, you know, continuous discovery. And we, the more we learn about, um, the more we test different solutions, the more we learn about the problem, blah, 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 blah. So I, I, th I think it's, it's, it's only good. Um, but thinking of, uh, you know, this... Um, uh, I had Bob Moest, I, I love Bob's work. Uh, I, I love Bob, um, uh, not, not, I don't love Bob, I love Bob Moesta's work. <laughs> um, and he actually talked about something really interesting, which was um, hypothesis forming research and hypothesis um, driven research. That's how, that's how he phrased it. And I, I know that from the user research uh, uh, side of the house, they, they would say uh, generative research for hypothesis forming research, so just different terminology there. But what he, what he says is very interesting. He says that um, when it comes to interviewing users uh, and customers, so doing uh, customer interviews, he says, uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm paraphrasing by the way, I'm not smart enough to come up with hypotheses or the assumptions. Uh, I usually find the most important insights through the questions that emerge in the moment from the conversation, like the follow-ups basically. Um, so he, he's a big fan of hypothesis forming research, basically. But I wanted to ask you, how do you, um, when it comes to continuous discovery, and you, you, we're talking with customers every, you know, every week, ideally, um, how do we balance that act of testing specific assumptions versus having a more explorative uh, discussion? Yeah, That's so a Teresa the... question. Yeah. So in the book, I, there's two, I talk about two primary activities as part of continuous discovery. One is continuous interviewing, one is assumption testing. In the generative evaluative language, interviewing is generative, or in Bob's language, hypothesis forming, and assumption testing is evaluative or hypothesis testing. Mm. Here's the thing, I don't like evaluating solutions in interviews. I know a lot of people do it. I don't like it. I want to evaluate my solutions based on what people do, not based on what they say. I think it's a really important distinction. So when I talk about interviewing, I am 100% talking about generative insight driven uh, research. Scenario not, based. Not, um, we're not talking about the product. We may, we're probably not even talking mm -hmm. about the company. We're talking about the customer only and the customer's experience. I think that's often overlooked um, but I think it's one of the most critical things to remember. And this is, so Bob Moesta teaches a lot about jobs to be done. And what I love about the jobs to be done framework is it's really, there's so much overlap with what I talk about with the opportunity space. Um, and a jobs to be done purchase interview is actually the same thing I teach with story-based interviewing. A jobs mm -hmm. to be done purchase interview, tell me the story of buying this yeah. product. Tell me a specific instance. What I'm trying to do, that's great when you're looking at why does someone buy something. Mm -hmm. it, it's not gonna apply to all contexts, right? So with story-based interviewing, I'm trying to generalize it to work for all product teams, whether there's a purchase decision or not. But the underlying principles of both are really the same. When we're, when we're looking mm -hmm. for generative insights, keep our customers grounded in stories about specific instances. It's not about your product. It's not about what you're trying to do. It's not about getting feedback on your solutions. It's about learning who's Petra, what does Petra need, what is Petra doing? Mm -hmm. And this is, by the way, the type of interviewing that one would do in a product leadership role to start the strategy creation and forming process. Mm -hmm. Just different altitudes, exact yeah. same habit. Mm -hmm. Very good. And I also love that you mentioned that the say-do gap. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure if that's from originally from David Bland, um, but I love the way he phrased it or the way he frames it um, on evolving the evidence from what customers say to what customers do. Um, but okay, good. That, that was, a, I think, a really important distinction. At least I had that question when I was uh, interviewing Bob. I was uh, immediately thinking, how does this uh, relate to Teresa's work? And um, so good, good, to, good to clarify. But 
still on that uh, topic though, there is, I find that there is some confusion sometimes between user research and product discovery or continuous product discovery. And I, I think it's a little unfortunate that it has become a little bit of a hot topic as well. Like I, I feel that um, a lot of user researchers get, get, get sometimes a little bit defensive and the argument is, yeah, but we've, we've been doing this stuff for decades. And, and I, I see it as, as two different things, but I wanted to, of course, hear for you. I, I know this is a more Teresa uh, question, but I, Somebody I also Somebody did a to... lot of research on that. Even some number crunching, Teresa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Share the numbers. Teresa, uh, is this uh, too, gonna, too, too hot of a topic to I'm dive gonna into? I'm going to pause and, and do a little breath <laughs> exercise before I respond. Okay. Uh, <laughs> There's, there's so many ways I can tackle this. I'm going to start with some numbers. Uh, I did these numbers crudely, and then Lenny Ruchitsky actually has put out some really good, even better numbers around this. Uh, here's how I did it. I paid for a month of LinkedIn Sales Navigator so I could see how many people were in different roles. And uh, there's about 50,000 uh, user researchers in the world. There's about a million product managers in the world. So if we just start from those two numbers, uh, some user researchers argue that product teams should not make any decisions whatsoever without user researchers support. Uh, last I checked, math is not math. I don't think a user researcher can support 20 product managers. I just, and I think I'm off, off by a factor of 10 there. Maybe it's 200. Uh, math off the top of my head is not my strong point. Um, okay, so first of all, we just simply don't have enough user researchers. So now someone's gonna argue well, why don't we just hire more user researchers? So then this is where I'm going to get myself into trouble, and I don't care because I'm so tired of this de debate. We have two different types of user researchers in industry. We have people that have come from academia, that have PhDs, that have some of them have deep research skills. Now, I say some of them because it depends on how you did your P. Like, if you have a PhD in electrical engineering, I'm not so sure like, that gave you the research skills to write a survey. But I have seen PhDs in engineering become user researchers in industry, and they argue they have research skills that other people don't have. So there's a little bit of like, people are using, oh, I'm gonna make some enemies, I know. People are using letters after their name to like over argue their point of view. And it's kind of pissing me off, which is why I'm getting a little mm. bit heated right now. Okay, so we have, we have some researchers who have PhDs who have real, depth of research skills that apply to industry. So that is a segment of people. We also have a segment of user researchers who learned their research skills on the job. Okay, so if you can learn your user research skills on the job, why can't a product manager? Why can't a designer? Why can't an engineer? Why can't a data analyst? Why can't a CEO? So that's one question I have. Like I really like genuine question Okay, so then there's a third piece. Some user researchers believe that no business should make a decision without user research. This is also a really faulty argument. Okay, let's just take an example. I'm a two-person founding team. I'm ready to launch my product into the market. I need to figure out a price point. I can do one of three things. I can make up a number from the top of my head. I can look at what similar products are priced at. I can do a formal research study to determine my price. Two person founding team working for free, zero dollars in revenue. Which of those three things should they do? Opinions? <laughs> I don't want to be the only one in hot water here. Either so of you want to I throw would out go an opinion? for one, being brave. I have gut feeling, I have experience in the industry, so I would just make a guess, and then that's the price, and then we see how things go. Okay, so you would pick a number. Afonso, what would you do in that situation? Pick a number two. Okay, interesting. So not even number two, where you'd look at competitive pricing. Okay, interesting. Now Maybe they're all under pricing. Let me give you another scenario. Uh, I'm now a multinational global comp. I'm a product manager at a multinational global company. I work on our pricing team. We have realized from talking to customers that our pricing is too expensive for some people and there's other people that tell us they get way more value out of the product and they think it's underpriced. 
and my job is to come up with a new pricing strategy, which of those three things should I do? Should I make up a number? Should I uh, look at competitors? Or should I do a formal research study into pricing? Now I would do C. Yeah. Same. same. Okay, so context matters, right? Like we all intuitively know this, but if you argue with some, I wanna be really clear, some user researchers on the internet, mm -hmm. the stance is nobody in business should make a decision without a formal research study. It is ridiculous, right? That's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. It's a, it's a bit like the conversation of should we have product managers at all? Yeah. And that's kind of a similar discussion, right? Yeah. Um, it's but, a hot take as well. And I am a product management person, so hell yes, do I think we need them? But context, again, if you're a two people company, maybe not, even not if you're a 50 people company, maybe not. Yeah, so back to the original question of like user research and product discovery, it really depends on the context. First of all, the vast majority of us do not work in an organization with user researchers, and this question is completely irrelevant. For the small number of us that work in organizations with user researchers, I think the answer to how they should work together is entirely dependent on how your user researchers want to work. Some of mm. them believe that their skills are unique and that only they should do research. And if I'm working with someone like that, I sure as hell am not going to convince them that they should be part of my product discovery efforts. I'm going to let them do their own project-based research and I'm going to leverage it in whatever way I can and I'm going to do my own discovery. Mm -hmm. There is a large segment of user researchers that believe their job is to enable better research across the organization. And That's if I amazing. Work with, if I work with someone like that, I'm going to partner with them and I'm going to get their feedback on my yeah. discovery and I'm going to integrate them into what I'm doing and I'm going to use them as much as I can. And mm. just philosophically, I wish every company had both. I wish every company yeah. would invest in research and do longer horizon, more strategic project-based research. And I wish every product team would do product discovery. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So the, the, the way I see this, by the way, is that if you have both, which would be a luxury scenario, um, you could have the user research team or the user researchers explore longer horizon opportunities, uh, whereas strategy. the product team is... Yeah, because th th then, then again, it's, it's another feedback loop, right? We talked yep. about the, the, the first yeah. feedback loop coming from, from continuous discovery from the product team, uh, testing assumptions really fast, getting fast evidence. Vision typing, a thing here. Right? And then user researchers dealing with longer, t longer horizon opportunities, but also feedback looping for the, for the strategic context on, hey, this is what we, we're discovering, this is what we're exploring, these are some of the preliminary insights of what we're learning from, from the market, from this new market, this new opportunity that, we, that we're exploring. But also something that you mentioned, uh, supporting the product teams, doing even better discovery. I mean, what, what a luxury to have someone who really is skilled on, on user interviews by training, then that person can, can support as long as they don't take the lead in a way, uh, as long as they let the product team do the work but if it's more of an enabling team kind of pattern in a way, uh, that, could, that could be interesting. The you other know the part, um, yeah. the part I really don't understand is let's say I am a trained researcher. Like I have a PhD, I'm trained in qualitative or quantitative methods. Like I really geek out on research. Do you really want to spend your life usability testing designs? Like I don't even understand why this is a debate, right? Like. You have good research skills. Let's use those research skills for really important questions. Yeah, like exactly. the thing I'm shipping this week in the grand scheme of things is not the most important decision for you to give input exactly. on. Like it's just, it's, I think I, I, what's I totally, happened, totally agree. most of this debate has just been skewed by, the, by social media. Like I think yeah. I did some, uh, several months ago, a number of user okay. researchers started personally attacking me saying that my book was responsible for them losing their jobs. Uh, there's actually data that shows that uh, user research is the, one of the fastest growing roles right now. Like, there's mm -hmm. a, I get that a lot of people lost their jobs and a lot of people have grief over that and I think that's perfectly valid. And I think a lot of what we're seeing on social media is an expression of that. Mm -hmm. But I think that expression is not necessarily grounded in reality or in data. For that reality for that person, Yes, they lost their job. Reality for the industry and industry trends, maybe not necessarily. And I think um, it's more a reflection of how toxic the internet and 
the tech industry has become around layoffs and not valuing people and not letting people do their best work. And I don't think it has anything to do with user research and discovery. And it's kind of why I just like my conclusion is I'm just tired of it. Like I don't, I don't really want to swim in the internet pool of endless debate about nothing. No, absolutely. Uh, and you know, John John Cutler's shared a, an article with me last week on, I can't remember the name of the author, but it was it's called uh, Prison Moments or Moment Prisons or something like that, which was about sometimes some industries get trapped in moments in the past and then we don't evolve. And then it's even worse when our identity becomes connected with what we do or the yeah. discipline we represent because then you're not attacking a role or, or a discipline then, then you're you know it's out of the people feel personally attacked in a way which which i which i think is um is ridiculous you know uh, so that therefore the thus the prison kind of um uh, title of it but anyway I did a lot of interviews with user researchers. Coming out of that, like those attacks, I got really curious. I was like, what is going on here? And I did probably 25 one-on-one -on -one conversations with user researchers that felt like my book had a, had a negative impact on their career. And um, I learned a lot of things. This is that, that split of like, there's kind of people with different backgrounds in user research came from this. Like I talked to a user researcher who said, um, my boss wants me to teach product managers how to conduct surveys. My problem with that is I don't know how to conduct surveys. Right? Mm. Okay, so this is somebody who's learning their job on, on the job. That's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of us learned our jobs on the job. Pretty much every product manager learned their job on the job, right? Like that's that, when I say a lot of user researchers learn their job on the job, it's not a criticism. This is the reality of our industry right now. Mm -hmm but they're being asked to do something they're not qualified for. That's a problem. Now, is it my book that caused that problem? I have a hard time seeing that inference, but mm. I get that other people see that inference and that's valid. I talked to a lot of PhDs, a lot of PhDs, who uh, when you talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, they get that not every decision in business is gonna be made based on research. What's at the core of that is, <clears throat> my work isn't valued by the business. And that is a legitimate problem. Business is just learning how to value research and how to get value out of research. And we should be talking about that. Like that's the productive conversation, not you, you're the reason I got fired. Mm. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. All right, so uh, moving on to, to a, a different part of the conversation. We've been kind of um, diving into, into it a little bit, but let's, let's assume that we now have strategic context, we know where we're going, the destination, we have a cross-functional team, we have the guardrails, all of that, all of that jazz. Um, and we've started you know, testing some assumptions. Uh, we, have a, we have an idea that we want to test and we've, we've dissected that idea into several assumptions. This is, to me, such an important um, uh, exercise or, you know, or part of, of the whole scheme of, of, of themes in, in discovery. The, the dissecting of an, an, an idea into several assumptions. But I know that a lot of teams do, a, do some mistakes or struggle with a few things. So I want to tap into both of your um, knowledge into what are some of those traps when people are thinking about assumptions, they hear you, you know, both of you say, hey, you need to test assumptions. Um, what are the things that usually go wrong when they are dissecting assumptions? Do you want to, who, who wants to start? I know you also have a lot of thoughts on this, Petra. Yeah, um, I'm sure Teresa has a more uh, structured approach to it. I just can anecdotally from what I observe. So the first thing that usually goes sideways is that in the moment when you have this cross-functional teams in a room, maybe the trio in, a t in the room, and they start ideating and they start to do maybe some first interviews, there's more insights. And then they fall in love with every idea that they have and are not yet flagging it to be an assumption. So it's kind of a hey, idea and then they're jumping right into it, maybe already prototyping on it and think like it's the best idea on the planet. Um, so this is usually the first thing that I, I see. Mm -hmm. Um, happening, but 
with a the, a great book at hand or a coach in the room that that's actually easy to fix because then it's just and it's to some extent it's terminology we call it assumption or I sometimes I really call it op idea and then we have an opportunity assessment and if it has potential your idea has potential and it could be business potential whatever you're currently optimizing mm. for then I start calling it an opportunity, but we still need to discover it. So I have this task board structure where the idea becomes an opportunity and then you need, still need to discover this opportunity to see if all the hypotheses that this opportunity has um, are valid, big enough to pursue if, you, if it's worse to go um, behind this idea and all these kind of things. So terminology matters to some extent um, because teams then start to ideate, start to see things, opportunities, mm. fall in love with these ideas and off they go. So that's usually the first thing that I, I think matters to just be really precise on, hey, no matter where the idea comes from, it could be stakeholders, it could be um, higher up leadership, it could be the team itself, it could be the developer with the uh, Google Maps API that just uh, was launched last week. Um, all amazing ideas, but we need a bit of a process to assess them. And it could be our strategy, it could be our objectives, and then we could see if they really have some business um, um, value and, and uh, customer value in it. And then we do invest in more discovery, so a high level mm. assessment helps. Teresa, add yeah. to it or this disagree. Is, well, I think we use language a little bit differently here. So I want yeah, to see we if do. I can clarify <laughs> it a little bit. So when I use opportunity, I use it to represent a customer need or a pain point or a desire. So it's not an idea, right? It's, a, it's something inherent to your customer that represents an opportunity to create value for them. Mm. And um, in the question I heard, uh, we're starting with an idea and we get, we want to get to assumptions. I actually don't want you ever starting with an idea. And that's because of what Petra just said. When we start with an idea, we fall in love with it. We overcommit to it. And if I just say, Hey, Petra, tell me about your favorite idea. What assumptions do it, de does it depend upon? The Google map, mm -hmm. Teresa, we could map all the people where they live and then they could yeah. meet over coffee. <laughs> There's no assumptions. Like we're blind to assumptions. When we, when we fall in love with our ideas, we're blind to our assumptions. Like there's nothing that could possibly go wrong. It's the best idea ever. Of course, it's going to work. And so <laughs> the way to circumvent this is I want you to work with a set of ideas. And this is where the opportunity really matters. Like the opportunity representing a need. Like. I understand that Petra needs something. She wants to connect with other alums if we run with this idea. Yeah, so how might we solve that? I wanna come up with lots of ideas. I wanna pick what I think are the three best ideas. And then for each of those ideas, I wanna identify the assumptions that they depend upon. Mm -hmm. So this idea of a compare and contrast decision, not is my idea great or not. Mm -hmm. um, no. This is, it's so often overlooked, but I think it's, Mm. There's one thing you change about your product practice. Work getting in the habit of comparing and contrasting sets of ideas, even if you do nothing else, I think can have a huge impact on what you build. Um, and then you still are going to run into the problem. If I say what needs to be true for your idea to work, you're going to have a million blind spots. And that's where I really like, I've designed a number of exercises to help teams get really explicit and specific about their assumptions. One of which is I borrowed um, Jeff Patton's version of story mapping and extended it for this. Um, we also, there's a number of exercises where you can do a data audit to start to uncover some ethical assumptions. You can do an ideal customer profile to get at some ethical assumptions and even viability assumptions. So there's a number of exercises you can do to get really specific about those assumptions. Um, but I think the key is to work with sets of ideas. Mm. So, but, so what you said is the key here is to have a set of ideas rather than just one idea because of primarily cognitive bias. We just think that's the best idea and therefore uh, it can't go wrong. But your point is, if we, if we, start, with, um, if we start with the outcome, the things we want to achieve that derive from the larger strategic context, um, then we ideate as much as possible with like different ideas and then unpack those ideas into assumptions and we test them. Is that what you... 
Yeah, there's an opportunity in there. So we're starting with an outcome. Right. As we interview, we're collecting opportunities. We're choosing a target opportunity. For that target opportunity, we're working with a set of solutions, breaking each one down into their underlying assumptions. And then the key assumption testing is supporting the compare and contrast decision. It's not just cognitive biases that are at play. Here's one of the most common questions I get. Teresa, I took my idea, I broke it down into its underlying assumptions, I tested this one assumption, I created a prototype, I got feedback from my customer. <laughs> what does it mean? How do I know if their feedback is good enough or not? Hmm. You don't, because you're not comparing it to anything, right? right. Good is not this absolute trait where we're going to be like, oh, we crossed the threshold. I mean, some people will tell you. People will be like, oh, well, when the person says, can I pay for that right now? Okay, but you're so rarely going to encounter that for a feature, right? Like, mm. we don't have a magic line that we can recognize that says this was good enough. The way that we evaluate if something is good enough is we compare it to other things and we pick the one that's clearly better so that's the value of the compare and contrast. Like I can do a whole bunch of discovery activities. How do I know my conversion rate's good enough? How do I know that my mm. prototype feedback's good enough? How do and I know that- And maybe even by in the process of comparing and contrast, fig figuring out that two solutions have the same or similar potential, but one is way easier to build. Yeah. Ta -da, then you have another winner. Mm. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, so it's a whole, whole trade-off, obviously, of, of variables that come into play. And one thing around the assumptions that I wanted to dig into a bit is that I feel from observing different product teams at work is that they sometimes f focus too much on the product, like the assumptions of the product rather than the whole business model. And, you know, um, as, as you know, like the success of the product is tied to the success of the business model a, a, a lot of times. And so I wanted to dig in into this a little bit. But first, like... Um, how do you coach teams to, to actually uh, think about the whole dimensions of the business model and testing assumptions on the whole business model rather than just the value proposition? Um, I'm sure you have a lot of thoughts even how I'm phrasing these things. Um, and, and, and yeah, so why don't we start there? Like, I think it depends on the scope of the yeah. team. If I'm a two-person founding team and I'm trying to figure out what to build, I'm following David Bland's process. I'm using a business model canvas. My assumptions are around all the boxes on the canvas and I'm testing my business model. The vast majority of product teams are not impacting their business model. Their product exists. It has an established, it has an established business model. They're adding new functionality. They're extending functionality. They're iterating on functionality. At that scope, the business model questions have already been answered. And they yes. often have no idea what the business model actually is, how it looks like, what the funnel actually is, and how they Absolutely. could influence these That's things. That's yeah. a whole separate problem that we could get into. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. there is a, there is a middle a ground, point. right? Like, I might be building functionality to enable a new business model. I might be building functionality mm. to, like, a lot of teams ha recently moved to, like, usage-based pricing. You might be changing functionality to get more value out of a usage-based pricing model, right? So it's mm -hmm. not that, it's not just founders that have to care about the business model and do testing at the business model level, but I think the majority of product teams, the business model, they need to understand the context and they need to understand how their work contributes to it, but they're not testing business model assumptions. They're testing customer behavior assumptions that usually are driving engagement that's supporting a business model. Mm. But wouldn't you say, I, I partially agree, but I'm still missing a link here because one, one thing is, okay, remember the business outcome from, that we talked about. Um, and let's say that we dissected that into product outcomes and we can see a leading indicator there, but we still, we look at our business model and we say, okay, hypothesis, what if we change the channels from this to this? Or what if we find a new key partner that would be able to do X. What if blah, 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 blah. So all different assumptions around the business model that if, if true would also lead to the business outcome. Wouldn't that be then a way to actually might... innovate on the business model rather than the product, the value prop? You know, That's a strategy loop that we're now closing. 
I think it I think it depends, right? Like yeah. let's let's take a real simple subscription business. I'm going to find a new partner to bring in more subscribers. Is that a business model change? I would argue no, my business model is still just subscriptions. It's a it's a mm-hmm. It's a tactic for how to acquire more subscribers. Win market, yeah. Yes. Right? Now, yeah. if I decide in addition to my subscription model, I'm going to add a one-time purchase option for this product, that's a business model change. And that's mm-hmm. going to be a lot closer to what a founder is doing. And if, if a product team is considering a change to their business model, they probably need to be testing it with a business model canvas. And by the way, ideally, your strategy tells you if you should do any of these things. Definitely. Mm. Yeah, but okay. So, so the, I, I, re, I love the, it's not a split, but I love the, the mental model of for smaller teams where, you know, founders are more involved and you're still very early, then business model canvas, hypothesis around, blah, blah, blah. That process works kind of very well. Um, for larger organizations where you already have these bus- most business models of most products because these organizations are usually multi-product uh, the business models of these products are is already set so now it's about optimizing it it's about finding out new things and it's about you know pursuing ad- adjacent um a value maybe sunsetting then, products even right exactly so in that in that in those contexts what you're saying Teresa, is that um then it's more important to actually find the KPI tree that we talked about, Petra, you know, and, and the product outcome and, and focus more there. Is that what you, is that what you, okay. I, I, I would not even say it's related to team size. I would say it's related to, is your business model working? Are people right. buying your product at a rate that is supporting your business goals? If the answer to that question is yes, you don't need to worry about your business model. If the answer to that question is no, which is the case for a lot of us, then you have to ask, is it because we're missing the mark on our product outcomes? Our product outcomes aren't driving enough of our business outcomes? Or is it because we have the wrong business outcomes, meaning we have to question the business model? And the distinction between those two is a little bit harder, but companies don't revisit their business model on a daily basis, right? Most product teams are driving product outcomes. They're not questioning business outcomes. But there are points not, where it happens. Yeah, and it's oftentimes not on the IC level people to do this either, right? So that yeah. would be more a managing up scenario where you're kind of mm. flagging the issue that you think somebody should revise the strategy. It's more, that's why I was saying like, now we're closing the feedback loop on the strategy thing. Because if this is something that you find um, your product team if, that, if that's the place you're finding your product team and then that's kind of a managing up solution uh, situation and you go to your head of product to your CPO whoever's there and share the story and then it's on them to say like are you right we need to re, re kind of recalibrate our strategy maybe even the company mm. strategy not only the product strategy these things are often so if you really change the business model if you pivot I think that's um, more most often a product leadership conversation executive I, management conversation. I agree with that. And I think this is exactly what Petra said earlier about product leaders are doing discovery at a different altitude. So mm-hmm. they're doing that discovery at the business model level in the business outcome realm. Mm. And they and what's triggering that is, oh, my product teams are driving these product outcomes, but it's not in turn driving the business outcomes. Exactly. Or they can't drive these product outcomes. They've tried and tried and tried and this is the wrong value to be delivering. Or we're, we're targeting the it. wrong market. New countries <clears throat> yep. need to be exactly. targeted, yep. whatever. I, I love this. And I, I, I really like the managing app point where if the product team or let's say the product manager identifies that um, and if she realizes, hey, we're not actually exploring a business model change, we are optimizing for something that actually could be uh, in a different model, then that managing up uh, situation is very important, uh, of course. Yeah. To make people Should aware we? And, and That's the question. Should yeah, we? Exactly. <laughs> and yeah. I'll, tell I'll story, share right? this, I think, is the strength of the jobs to be done purchase interviews, right? Mm-hmm. If you're interviewing people about how they buy something, how they chose to buy something, you're going to hear things that may be misaligned with your business model. 
And that's also a really good trigger for is it time to revise? Yeah, yeah. But but then on, on, on this one, um, I promised the listeners that I would land on this at some point uh, and to you. Uh, growth teams. We've, we've all heard a lot about growth, which I'm not sure why growth versus marketing and you know there's a there's a lot in there on 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 the terminology but but that aside um we we just talked about uh, a product trio focused on you know growing a specific part of the of 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 the experience or the product or, or the business right driving product out, product outcomes that uh, lead to business outcomes and and Teresa, a few minutes ago you even Give an example of uh, usage-based pricing, sort of finding out, uh, blah, blah, blah. How is that team differing from a growth team, which in theory should maybe be doing those optimizations and those discoveries as well? I think this question is exactly the same as the user research question. Mm -hmm. I might okay. make a whole bunch of new enemies. This can be fun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, here's what I'm going to say. I think there are But the people... ideal outcome is super similar as well, Teresa, right? Yeah. I think there are people <laughs> that have real skill in the area of growth. It's an area that they've decided to focus their career. They have a lot of experience. They've developed a lot of tactics. Onboarding they're good, they're good strategists growth. in growth. Mm -hmm. Some of them live in a growth department. Some of them live in a product department. Some of them live mm -hmm. in a marketing department. I don't really care what we call them. I don't really care where they sit because I think every organization has to decide what's the right way to do it for them. I think the thing to acknowledge, if every single person isn't in your company isn't focused on growth, something is going dramatically wrong in your company. And that doesn't mean there aren't individuals with particular growth skills that are different from what everybody else has. Just like I think if everybody in your company better be customer centric, and that doesn't mean that researchers don't have research skills that other people don't have, but everybody mm -hmm. should talk to customers. And I heard somebody, I wish I could remember who, it was two women, they were on Lenny Richitsky's podcast and they were talking about data and about how data, the growth of data analysts, I think they use this as their analogy. Maybe they're, I don't remember what function they were talking about, but I think it applies to all of these satellite functions that we're trying to figure out how, where do they fit. When organizations get more data focused, they don't hire fewer data analysts, they hire more. And when data analysts help enable everybody in the company to make data driven decisions, the company, just because they suddenly have flashy dashboards, doesn't say, let's get rid of our data analysts. What happens is the simple questions become self-serve. And when we can self-serve our simple questions, we get to more complex questions. And that's when we need the skilled folks. And I think this is true for growth. I think it's true for data. I think it's true for user research. When we enable everybody in Product the organization. Pro, yeah, when we enable <laughs> everyone in the organization to self-serve the simple questions, we allow our experts to spend all their time on the harder questions. Mm. Amen. Yeah, comments to that, Petra. <laughs> No, Teresa said it all, yeah. but that's why, so that's why I added product ops to the mix, right? So whenever we create mm. these functions, the specialized functions, I think there is a reason why we do so. <clears throat> because there are a lot of things that a growth person, and it, it, you can start everywhere, right? Like growth hacking. Is it something we want to do? Is it something we don't want to do? Is gamification our product a way that we want to do it? Is it ethically and morally okay to do so um, to drive sales or something like that. So there, there is a conversation to have and there are people um, hopefully in an organization that have the skills and the knowledge to have this conversation with the rest of the organization and hopefully they're consulting with the product teams, hopefully they, ha they share all their knowledge, maybe they even train the people within the organization. So I think that's amazing. So we need the experts. We really need these experts because mm. we can't make every product person an expert in growth hacking, product-led growth, user onboarding, all these kind of things. It's impossible um, and it's, it's equally impossible to have all of them knowing how 
every mobile app is currently working or how all the ChatGPT AI stuff is working, right? So we need mm -hmm. the experts. We need plenty of them. That's, by the way, why Teresa in the beginning said, like, maybe it's not a trio that we talk about. Maybe it's mm -hmm. four, five people. Because mm -hmm. in some team, you want to have the growth expert be part of that trio. That is then no longer a trio, I know. But you get the idea. Um, and the same applies with the machine learning folks. Or the same applies, I, by the way, have one of my clients has six data analysts per product person. Wow. So there is six data analysts in every product team. Does it make sense? I don't know. <laughs> mm. Is that something that I want to change in the future? I guess so. Um, but, but at some point, they just learned that being data-driven would help them. And they really see a sort of positive impact um, with that. So they increased the number of data analysts, what Teresa said, right? And now they have all these kind of people. And yet they hit a mark where it's no longer helpful and they need to reorganize and reshuffle it a bit. And people get more skilled about how to generate data, track data, work with data, storytell with data. Um, so maybe that's another um, reason why they don't need that many of them anymore but yeah it's always this back and forth um, with the experts and not so much of the experts in the teams but mm. I think we need these people as long as they are helping everybody to get better in this exact thing they're specializing in I think it's also yeah. context dependent like if I'm a <clears throat> if I'm a hundred percent startup and I'm in like scale up mode and anybody who's been through this at a startup knows like literally everything you've built up until this point is breaking all at once. So 100% of your product teams are trying to keep the lights on. That is what scaling up fast often looks like. Mm. And if at the same time that's happening, we're starting to see our growth, like we're, we can see how we're saturating our little segment of the market. Mm. Guess what? I might bring on a growth team because my product teams are busy. They're trying to keep everything from falling apart. Right. I'm not saying that's the only context in which a growth team might make sense, but like, again, it might make, that might be the model. If I'm a really mature company and over the years, our product teams have optimized the crap out of everything. And the way we're going to get to growth is some blue ocean strategy going into an adjacent market or adding a whole new product. I'm probably not building a growth team for that. I'm probably having my product leaders do some strategy work with some product teams. Right. So, it, I think it depends on what's going to, where your stage of the company, the resources you have, and Definitely. what's going to drive that growth. And for the people that have growth in their title, are those the right skills? Mm, absolutely. Very good points. All right, I can see time is flying. Uh, of course it is. Such an interesting conversation. So um, I have a few other topics. Let, let's go into. Uh, creating an environment, like uh, the, basically the system, looking into that and uh, diving into a, a little of the more of the product leadership sort of responsibility of ensuring that system is in place. Um, so, first of all, just to set up set us up in, into into the right tone, there are there's a lot of discussions on autonomy and empowerment these days, and not not to mention founder mode, but um, there's a uh, process, there's governance with product ops coming in, the movement, you know, um, and one thing that keeps coming up is do companies have a discovery process or do companies have, you know, more like a guide, sort of a toolkit that, that teams can use, um, uh, yeah, to basically ensure that they, they are, they're answering the right questions or at least to guide them answering the right questions. So I wanted to ask you both, Teresa, from a discovery perspective and, and Petra, more from a product leadership perspective, how do you see these um, um, discovery processes? Should companies have it? Should, should they not? What are some good examples that you've seen related to this topic? What's your take on this, basically? Petra, you, would start? you like to start? start. Yeah. yeah, again, it's so, so much depends on context, company size, maturity of the leadership team, all these kind of things, right? Um, but should... A company have a let's call it product operating model for the time being um, I'd say definitely yes can it be super lightweight 
please yes as well. So I think it does not um, has to be a rigid framework that tells everybody what to do, how to do product discovery, which tools to use. Don't use jobs to be done, only use opportunity solution trees. That's basically not what I think is important. We, we let the product people do their work with whatever tools and frameworks they think they too can do that work in the most efficient way. And we want to make sure that they're able to innovate on behalf of the user, right? That's what we want to do. So, and Teresa has her um, discovery habits, for example, is that something that I want to, to enable people with in my organization? Then this is actually what, the, what where the hard work happens. In as a leader, I have to sit down and think about, okay, how can I help people adopt these habits, build these habits, practice these habits, keep that pra uh, habits, and maybe refine these habits? And how can I, in the moment when they're learning, protect them a bit from the outside world because for some, that's, that's at least my take. I, I know that other people have other takes, but my take is in the beginning, they need a bit of protection because they are slower when they're picking up mm. a, a new practice or a new methodology. And, but slower doesn't, does not equal, um, equally mean worse, right? Their outcomes can be way better. The work that they deliver has bigger impact can not necessarily has <laughs> that that's not there there is no guarantee mm. here mm. and make sure that if you if you're in a leadership position make sure that people understand that the actual work is the thinking and the digesting maybe taking a walk around the block every once in a while after you use the interview so that is the work as well i think this is a super important part that leaders hold that space for their teams that are currently practicing that they have the time to do the thinking work the structuring work the digesting work the sorting things on whiteboards work um, and then help them with not being the sheldons in the room right that's that's then the second part of the process to really make sure that they can share what they done, they can share how this was better than the process that they had in the past. Um, and one way I like to, to do this is first start to do it internally in a community of practice kind of setup. So not mm. go out to your stakeholders and management and say like, hey, there's a new way of working and it's amazing. So your pilot team can first start to talk to peers other teams and see how how that lands and then see if they are interested and curious in adopting because the good things always stick if you share your success story from your discovery or your interview or you had an amazing service design or on a great scenario that was so helpful to, uh, in your interviewing process then share it with the other teams the other product people the other product trios do this community of practice work and then see what sticks. And that is actually how you could over time create this product operating model. Or if you're an experienced product lead, then you have your product operating model. A lot of experienced, so I have my product op uh, operating model. Um, if I would need to uh, run a product organization tomorrow or take over a product organization, I know how I would be actually doing it. I know what things I would like to measure. I know, okay, in the beginning there is most often no strategy. I know it takes me three months to create an okayish one. Um, so these kind of things, right? If you, in experienced product, you have your operating model, but then again, still context dependent, look at the people that you got, how junior are they, how senior are they, how much do you need to guide them? Um, because sometimes the people are super ambitious, but unexperienced. And then maybe coaching is the right thing to do. And sometimes maybe people are super inexperienced and not so ambitious. And then, yeah, maybe you need to tell them what to do in the beginning and then make room for them to grow. Um, and some call that founder mode. Um, I would <laughs> maybe <laughs> try to avoid that mode for too long of a time. I don't think command and control is making us successful in the long run. It's really kind of leveraging everybody's experience and diverse background and then innovate on behalf of the user. And this is rarely happening when you're in crunch mode, when you're in founder mode when you're in kind of a control, command and control model. So for the time being, is it maybe the right methodology? Yeah, you should be as a leader fluently moving in this different leadership styles. I have a blog post on that as well, how you should be fluent in this leadership style. Um, 
and when to transition into which kind of leadership style, but it should not be your predominant leadership style. Yeah. But protecting the teams a bit, helping them learning the ropes, helping them to build the, the habits, I think this is important. And then make sure at, in, in the end, it becomes a bit of a process. I use this metaphor of the shipyard sometimes. So the teams build the ships and the vessels and the boats. Mm -hmm. And somebody has to take care um, of the shipyard around it. So how do we get the material to the docks? And how do we make sure there's enough staffing available and all these kind of things? So that's the leadership part of it. But then please, go out of the way of the people and let them do their work we hired skilled people mm. to do that work so um, we don't want to tell them mm. what to do for a longer period of time mm. ideally Teresa rip it apart no not at all I think I'm going to add to it I think okay so some people say process is bad I know Marty Kagan likes to rip on process a lot but then he also talks about a lot of process right I think the challenge is process for its own like you know what? I'm going to bring it back to the Agile Manifesto. I think it goes all the way back to this idea of Classic. each team needs to figure out how they best operate and they need to have the ability to do retrospectives and to change the way they operate based on what works best for them. So that means mm -hmm. we have to let go of this idea of every single team in the organization is going to do exactly the same thing. So Petra mm -hmm. said, like, use your own frameworks, use your own tools. Great. But ideally, that's awesome. The challenge pragmatically day to day is it can create chaos. So I think to make that work, there's three things that need to be in place. Culturally, we have to have guiding principles. This is how we do our work. And that's not we follow jobs to be done. That's not what I mean by that. It could be we're measured on outcomes. At the end of every quarter, we're going to ask you about your progress towards this outcome. It could be we talk to customers regularly. Feel free to use Bob Muesta's interview techniques. Feel free to use Teresa's t interview techniques. Feel free to use Rob Fitzpatrick's interview techniques or Cindy Alvarez's interview techniques. But you've got to be talking to customers every week, right? Um, maybe a guiding principle is uh, we compare and contrast. These are, would be my guiding principles. They don't need to be yours. But I think the key is that a leader has to set this is the way that we do our product work. And then, but in a way that gives the, room, the teams room to make them their own. Mm -hmm. And then I think the second thing needs to be in place, uh, Melissa Perry really influenced my thinking on this with her product operations book, is if everybody's mm -hmm. using different tools and everybody has their own methods, how do you communicate what you're working on to the rest of the organization? And so you need to have a shared set of outputs whether that's a shared roadmap format yeah. or a shared sprint format or a shared quarterly update format, you really need to have a shared way of talking about the work that you're doing. And the work can happen in whatever format, but then it has to be translated into this shared way. And then I think the third thing that you need, one of the huge benefits you get from letting teams work the way they wanna work is you're running a million experiments. And if you wanna benefit from those experiments, you need a way for those teams to come together and share what they're learning and share what they're doing and share their practices. Mm -hmm. And that can be through what Petra referred to as a community of practice. It could just be a monthly meeting where teams share the greatest thing that happened that month. It, you don't have to overthink it, but there needs to be a way for somebody to say, I conducted an interview this way. Here's why it was great. So that mm -hmm. other teams can choose to adopt it or not. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or I just watched a talk and I loved it. And maybe it's interesting to mm. all of you or something like that. It can be really low key. Absolutely. No, I, I really think that the communities of practice are a great starting point as well to bring that uh, upskilling or, you know, conversations and, and showcasing. And I, I love this um, mental model of driving with principles and setting some principles for what great discovery looks like in our context, in our organization. Then there's this messy middle here of, you know, what Petra mentioned that, you know, you can basically approach it uh, in different ways. And like, like Teresa Tori said, you can use different te techniques, different interview techniques as well, as long as you do them. So there's these principles that needs to be set. There's this messy middle that should exist. And then there's um, this output that is translated in a shared yeah. way that needs to be set ag again as well. So basically two things that need to be set and then the messy middle. Do you guys agree with that? Yeah. Petra, did you just say the socket? 
Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're such a nerd. I love it. <laughs> Sorry. It's like the product API. I couldn't, I couldn't let that slide. I actually didn't hear it. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it. I'm, I'm a nerd. <laughs> oh, amazing. But, uh, but, but okay, so that, that's, but do you, do you both agree with this? With this yeah. View yeah, or? absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, I think this amazing is a nice summary. way to frame it as well. Yeah, okay. Great. Good for me. It's, uh, my brain has been updated at this point. So that's good. New mental model. Um, all right, so uh, this is a big one. I, I'm looking at a big question. I'm not sure if I should ask it, but, but I'll, I'll go for it. We still have a few minutes. Um, as long as it's a very brief answer, by the way, because time is fine. But okay. Easy. Uh, what we do, love a challenge. What do, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So what do you do if you were working with uh, founders and, or CEOs that think they are Steve Jobs and just want to build features and products they envisioned during their shower. So basically, how do you even start? Um, and again, let's focus on if you're a product leader this time, because we talked about this as a product team perspective before. But imagine you are a CPO, you have a tough founder, uh, tough CEO, tough board, which I, I feel that not, not a lot of people talk about. Um, you have all these things in place and you really want to change. In fact, you were hired to implement the product operating model, but still, all behaviors are still there and, and, and it's still very output-ish. What would be your first things to do as a CPO, you think? The thing is, there's often something to the ideas. Because what they often have is a lot of experience about the industry, the competition. They maybe talk, even talk to the competition. CEOs sometimes talk, or at least your board members maybe do, because maybe they have invested in more companies in that industry and stuff like that. So first of all, be curious about why they think this idea is an amazing idea. Run an interview with them. So that's... That's basically what I would do. That's research to some extent, right? So they are, for me, they are as valid as every other stakeholder interview or every other user interview. So it's data points that I'm creating as a product lead. And hopefully we have an agreed upon strategy. And sometimes I have to remind them of our agreed upon company strategy um, <laughs> because the idea is so so not in line with the strategy that we just signed off four weeks ago and this is that that's then a conversation to have right so it's then it's not about their idea then it's more about okay but the idea that you're having has a magnitude that has an impact on the strategy that we just decided to pursue for the next 12 months so is this idea worth a worth it that we're bringing everybody into the, the whole offside crew um, are we bringing everybody in again are we reviewing the strategy again because if the answer is yes because your idea is so promising then let's do this so i think this is the first thing again that helps to understand like okay on what altitude um, would this idea impact the things that you currently planned? And therefore, for example, I always love to draw Martin Erickson's decision stack in such a situation mm -hmm. and say like, hey, look, we have a company vision, um, we have the company strategy, we have a product vision, a product strategy deriving from it, and then we have our goals, objectives, whatever you call it. Um, so on which level is your idea impacting the decision stack? If it's higher up, calls for a bigger meeting, more people, um, mm. and a bigger conversation to have. If it's a simple idea that a team can assess in their next iteration, maybe it has an impact on the quarter, hopefully not even on the quarter, maybe on their sprint goal or something like that. Mm. Yeah, then why not talking about it, right? But you need processes that actually say like, hey, that's how big your idea is. This is the people that we now need to, to, to talk to if this idea is something that you really want us to assess. And then again, compare and contrast. We need you as a product leader need then to be ready to say like, hey, this is a rock idea. It's big. It is basically the work of a quarter, more or less. These are the other five rock ideas that we're currently having. And this is the data that we're having for these rock ideas. And this is why we think the, pursuing them is the right, um, right thing to do. And by the way, this is the order that we currently see them happening in. Mm. Where does your idea come in? Let's help us figure that out. 
and then mm-hmm. offer help to create some data and then say, see where this conversation takes you. So that's, that's, that's the first thing that I would actually do. So you need to know your things, what's currently happening within the organization. You need to figure out um, the impact of the idea that they're having. And you need to stay curious about the idea because more often than not, they're wrong. And we're always bashing the ideas of the CEO and we're always bashing the ideas of the founders. But oftentimes there's a lot of truth in the ideas that they're having under the shower in the morning because that's where our minds are wandering and that's where we innovate. Um, and, or maybe they have been at the kite surfing holiday with some of our startup dudes. Um, but that's where great ideas sometimes come from as well. So yeah, stay curious. That would be my kind of uh, short Tish answer to the question, Teresa. <laughs> I think it's okay. going to depend on the stage of the company. So I'll talk through two briefly. If, if it really is an early stage company, you're working on your first version of the product, I think your job is to help realize the founder's vision. And so there's a few ways to do that. First of all, you're probably exposing the risk in the idea, but also helping to mitigate that risk. I think a lot of people make the mistake of just exposing the risk and saying, here's why your idea is terrible. And they don't follow through to helping to mitigate the risk. And then I think you mentioned boards in particular, and I think this is a really critical piece. I think usually a board matters after you've raised money. Before you raise money, if there is a board, it's usually friends of the CEO and you're just managing the founder. Um, But once you've raised money, it changes, right? And so I think as a CPO, You should have one-on-one relationships with everybody on your board. You should do the work to understand why did they invest in the company? What do they Mm -hmm. think the vision of the future is? Because it's not always going to be aligned with the founder. And you have to be, just like the CEO should be managing the board, which oftentimes they don't know how to do that part. I think if your job, you now have to manage all the individual visions on the board with the individual visions of the founder, And they're not, sadly, they're not always going to be aligned. Mm. But you have to be aware of that context because if you just focus on the founder, you're going to have a real tough time in board meetings. And if you just focus on the board members, you're going to have a real tough time with the founder. So it really is a game of uh, herding cats. And you can't herd cats if you don't know what they're all running after. (laughs) Very good point. That was short. Teresa (laughs) Petra. This was, it was. Yes. This is so great. I'm so grateful that we've, we've done this. Um, I love this. I it was love fun. It. Yeah, yeah, super thank fun. You. Super fun. <laughs> thanks for having us and thanks for having yeah. us together. Thank you. All right. We'll see. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. In a few weeks. Indeed. In Oslo. Yes. All right. Have a good one. Thank you. All right, that was it for today. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Make sure you subscribe to my newsletter so you don't miss out and see you next time.